This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. Do us a favor. If you like the pod, want to support it, go over to Prize Picks, sign up using that code CLNS, and that will help us tremendously. Yesterday, Greg, we had Gerard Mayo with the media. Earlier today, it was Robert Kraft's turn to hang out with you guys this morning. And I want to start with what Kraft had to say about Elliot Wolf's fate. There was something that he said that bugged me a little bit. He said, we'll evaluate Mm -hmm. the draft, see how that's gone, go from there. What are your thoughts about that approach? Um, I hate it. I mean, (laughs) look. Everybody knows, everybody listening to this pod, you, me, everybody else, every Patriots fan in the country, in the world, knows that this offseason, from the free agency with the cap space that they had, to this draft with the number three overall pick and whatever they do with it, whether it's a quarterback or they trade down and they get plenty of picks and they basically, you know, stockpile players, start bringing in young players that are going to be the foundation of this franchise going forward, everything is on this off season. Like, and so if, if now look, I will say maybe, maybe Kraft is just playing coy, which Mayo did not do basically when he slipped up and called Elliot Wolf, the general manager, and then was like, Oh, well, well, you know, whatever he is, Um, you know, perhaps Kraft um, who's, uh, certainly been around a block a few more times than Gerard Mayo. I'm hoping that he was just protecting the franchise uh, for the Rooney rule and all that stuff. And, and they'll get to that at some point in time. But if he's being truthful that this is like a trial run for Elliot Wolf, which I don't really believe because Alonzo Highsmith ain't coming here for a three month tryout. Like he's not doing all this work for a three month tryout. He's coming, he came here to be with his buddy, to be his right hand man, because Elliot Wolf knows that he's going to be the next guy and he's gonna be here for a while. And that's what I understand. But if if there's any part of him that is being truthful, that we need to see what they do in the draft and uh, that Elliot Wolf, whatever he does in the draft, and then we'll decide on his long-term fate, to me is just completely asinine and no way to run a franchise. I think that Wolf will be here for the reasons that you brought up. I don't think many of us believe he's going to be gone. The issue I had with what Kraft said is it just makes zero sense. How how in the mm. world can you evaluate anybody off the draft class within like two weeks of the draft? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. It's, it's going to take it, it takes at least two years to to look at a draft class, if not three, and say okay, that was a really good class or that class was terrible. So you're telling me based off the draft within the the month after, Kraft's going to be like, you know what? I really didn't like that 34th pick. He's got to go. It just, it doesn't make any sense. It it makes zero sense to me. Related to one thing about that, and I don't know if we've mentioned it on the pod, but um, there's a lot of chatter behind the scenes that Jonathan Kraft's son, I think his name is Harry, um, who played like a cup of coffee of football at Dartmouth. Um, And I think he was at one other college, but there's been some chatter behind the scenes that um, he's going to be groomed to sort of um, be a influential person in this franchise down the line. And it just made me laugh what you were talking about. Like, what are they going to go to Harry after the game and be like, did you like those draft picks, Harry? (laughs) Like, you know, does he have the draft magazines out? And then that's how they're going to determine the fate of Elliot Wolf. Yes, Harry is 27 years old, by the way. So he's absolutely the guy that you want to check out, you know, his his thought process on the draft. And that that was really the second thing that I took from it was, okay, so Kraft is not going to be involved with the football decisions. He's going to let Wolf run the draft, but then he's going to evaluate this draft within weeks. Is he talking to outside people? Is he consulting with people? Do those people want Wolf's job? It was just, it it was, again, it, it made no sense to me. All right, let's jump to Calvin Ridley. Um, Kraft said that Calvin Ridley's girlfriend was out on the idea of being here in New England. Is that plausible to you? Yeah, and it goes along with, you know, what I was reporting, you know, in real time when the decision was coming down. I said that he really doesn't want to leave the Jaguars. And, you know, I had heard about his wife 
um, that, you know, she's from the South. She didn't want to leave the South at the end of the day. And so the Titans, she's from Huntsville. I think that's not far from Nashville. So it, it made sense. I just thought it was a huge misstep for Robert to bring this up. Um, you just look, you just don't bring family into it. You don't bring, uh, I don't care if they're here, not here, whatever. I'm sure Calvin really is going to hear about this. He's not going to be happy about it. It's just, it was just a big faux pas to me. Um, I didn't like it. I also didn't like when he talked about that they were willing to go as far monetarily as they had to do, had to, to get the player. If it came down to it, talked about the 10% difference in the tax, like, I'm sorry. I just don't believe that. I I don't, I think the Patriots set a price on Calvin Ridley. They valued the Elliot Wolf and company. And, and I will bring up that, you know, Robert was quick to bring up Matt grow today, um, which was interesting, but whoever it is that the, the personnel triumvirate or whatever they're doing, um, I think they put a valuation on the player on Calvin Ridley, a guy who's 30, you know, we all know about his issues and they said, all right, well, we'll go $22 million a year, 40 plus million dollars guaranteed. We think this is a really solid offer. Here it is. But to say they would have gone, what, over $50 million if Calvin Ridley was was open to coming to New England? I'm sorry. Again, I just don't believe it. If you're willing to go there, then why didn't they go there? And see if Ridley was trying to, you know, pull a bluff. Uh, it, mm-hmm. So the reports were that the Patriots had the offer on the table. They put the offer on the table. They didn't move the offer off the table. They didn't add to the offer. They just put it there. And then Tennessee parachuted in with their offer, and it was game, set, match. Well, if you're willing to account for the taxes and make an even bigger offer, then why weren't you, you know, why weren't you there in the end? to try to match that. What we heard was the offer was the offer, the offer, and they didn't budge from it. So it, it's it's kind of strange. If you're telling me you're willing to go that high, then you've got nothing to lose to go that high if you've made that decision. And if he picks Tennessee, it's actually even better, Greg, isn't it? Like it's a, it's a better selling point for Robert Kraft to come back and say, hey, we put the same deal on the table. We, we knew mm-hmm. taxes. We, we put that money. We put that extra money into our offer to be fair to Calvin. And Calvin chose Tennessee, and it's free agency, and them's the breaks. So, yeah, I think you're exactly right, Nick. I mean, I think it would, if it was factually true that they would have gone to the lengths, like I think it would make Kraft, especially with all the the criticism they're getting as far as spending in some quarters, for Kraft to come out there and say, "Look, um, we 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 made an initial offer. The Titans came in." We decided to go over that. We offered them sixty million dollars guaranteed to, or fifty-five million dollars guaranteed to, to, um, and he, he could say, "You can go to the agent, you can go to the player, and ask him." We we offered to do that. He declined because he wanted to remain in the South. That would be very easy to do, um, but he didn't do that because I don't believe they were going to go to those financial lengths. When you talk about, you know, your intention to do something or you're willing to do something, but you don't do it, just gets a little hairy. All right, let's talk about Kraft and the third pick. Some people might not have taken from Kraft what he said, what I took from Kraft when he said something, but it stood out to me. Let's let's see if you feel the same way. Kraft saying that as a fan, he'd like to see the Patriots pick a quarterback at number three. Now, I know he added more to this and said, but if, you know, you never know how people are going to act and they they get desperate. Did you have an issue with Kraft saying, as a fan, he wants the quarterback at three? Um, Not really. I just wonder if behind the scenes and, and, you know, sort of parsing the words that Kraft had today about the quarterback and we're going to get a young quarterback and, you know, blah, blah, blah to me has ownership basically told Elliot Wolf, yeah, you can trade down, but you better make sure that you get a quarterback at some point and somebody that you believe in. And so, um, no, I didn't mind him saying that. I don't think it puts any, any pressure on Elliot Wolf. I think that Elliot Wolf is now that he has this shot, I think he's very confident in what he's doing. 
where the evaluation will be at the end of the day. And he's going to make his move. Now, is it going to be at three, five, six, eight, eleven? Uh, we don't know. But I think they I think they will have a plan and he'll be confident in in that he will execute that plan. I don't think this is the end of the world, but here's the issue I had with it. I do think it's somewhat passive aggressive from Kraft. And I, I don't know if that was his intention. But when you say, hey, as a fan, I want the quarterback at three, what you're telling us is you want the quarterback at three. So, you know, Elliot Wolf, with the background that we just talked about, Greg, this is somebody that is on a quote unquote lame duck contract. Even though you and I both believe that he will stay here long term, it is somebody who technically is working for his gig. And the owner comes out and he says, I'd love a quarterback at number three. That one, I do think, puts some pressure on Wolf because mm -hmm. now he's got to deal with it. Number two, it's unfair to Wolf in the front office in this way. If Wolf drafts a quarterback at three, you and I know that certain people are going to throw it out there and say, see, see, there it is, red herring. We've been telling you from the very beginning, Jonathan Kraft, Robert Kraft are making these decisions. Kraft said down in Orlando that they, he wanted a quarterback at number three. And what do you know? Here's Elliot Wolf picking the quarterback at number three. If that's the decision that Wolf makes, it, it throws that narrative into the ether and throws more gasoline on the fire when, to me, it's just Kraft should have said, we're leaving it up to Elliot in the front office. And what they do at three – what they do in the draft, that's all up to them. I support them with whatever decision they make, and we move forward. By just putting it out there, Greg, it just feels to me that now Elliott is not going to look like his own man if he makes that pick. I do not disagree with that, and I think it's a good point by you. It sort of um, keeps pushing forward the narrative like about Mac Jones, how it wasn't Bill Belichick's call, it was the Crafts call, which I, can, I think is complete bull crap. I always have. Um, I know people who were in the room who were involved in that. None of them have ever brought up Kraft's influence, but yes, his comment. It again, again, and and you know, the, sort of the theme of of Robert's press conference today. And and look, I have all the respect in the world for for Robert Kraft and what he's done, and for the league and for New England and the football team and all that stuff. And but. I thought today for him was definitely not his finest moment. I thought he underwhelmed in a bunch of different areas and he's, he's now playing the hits. He's, he, you know, he's trying to do what he always does, which is he wants to play to a, you know, a certain part of the fan base or, or most of the fan base and get them excited and talk about a quarter. I'm going to put my fan hat on because he knows that probably most fans want a quarterback at number three. They want that excitement and all that. So he's going to play into it where really it's not the best thing for the franchise for him to do that. I think you're exactly right. If he's, if he's interested in the franchise, getting things right and getting back on the right track, the correct response would have been, look, I certainly have my preferences, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the football team and, and what's in the best interest of the football team. And I have entrusted Elliot Wolf, Gerard Mayo, Matt Groh, Alonzo Highsmith to do that. And they can do whatever they want because I know they have the best interest of the football team at heart. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's a tournament season or the fight for a playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you could turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Testing my skills on prize picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps. Prize picks is really simple to play, and I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Use the code CLNS for the first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. More from Kraft, Greg. Uh, I, I know he took a step back after saying it, 
but he did mention the word playoffs today when talking about his expectations. What'd you make of that? Was that a mistake? Um, yes. I, I, I mean, I, I just think the, the Patriots aren't anywhere near that. Again, I think it's, I think it's him, you know, playing the hits for what he thinks is a majority of the fan base. And I'm, I'm, I'm just being optimistic and, you know, that's who I am and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I understand that, but, you know, <laughs> How can they go through the offseason that they just did? And I do think he had some valid points about that. We had like we didn't hear from Gerard Mayo as much yesterday about like I thought it was interesting and it certainly perked my ears up a little bit that he talked about, you know, when I when I sort of went back at him because he opened up saying about how excited he was and about the direction that they're going and all this stuff. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like. You say you're excited about what's going on. A majority of the Patriots fans do not think they're not excited about what's going on. If not, some of them are downright angry. And I think that, you know, him talking about playoffs, again, is just throwing a bone out there where it, just be realistic. And, and again, what I meant to finish my thought was him talking about, like, there could be people available in after the draft and, and cuts and trades and things like that. And I do think that that's part of their plan that we've talked about, especially a wide receiver. And so that was good to hear, but you can't go through, have all that cap space, do nothing. And I'm not saying they should have done nothing, but just from appearances sake, and then say, yeah, we're going for the playoffs this year. Like the two just don't marry up. So just be honest with people, give them a dose of reality. They're big people. They can handle it. You know, just, Stop playing the hits and start giving them reality. And when you walk it back like he did, because, again, I, I, I want to make this clear. He said the playoff word, and then he kind of went back and said, well, you know, he mentioned patience or whatever the hell. Now you're like wishy-washy, right? Now you're sending mixed messages because I think you went a little too far to appease certain people by mentioning playoffs, then realized that maybe in real time and said, oops, maybe I need to go back to the idea that we're building this thing. And it's just you you have to get one clear message together as an organization. And it feels like Wolf and Mayo have done a better job of that since the early, you know, burn cash and all that stuff. They've done a little bit better of a of a of a job of that. Today I thought Kraft stumbled a bit. And when you bring up playoffs, again, people are gonna listen to that. They're gonna hear that word. And you are not a fan. I appreciate Robert wanting to be a fan, and he can be a fan at heart, but inevitably he's the owner of the football team, and you set the expectations. And when you go out there and you say things like, hey, I'd love a quarterback at number three, and hey, playoffs, certain people hear those things. Fans hear those things, and now you've set the expectations. So I I thought it was a mistake, and Robert's been at this for a long time. He should understand that, that you can't just throw that stuff out there when you're coming off a four-win season, for the love of God. If you make the playoffs, awesome. We would all love to see it, but don't go out there and say it, even if you back away from it. All right. Um, did the did the I didn't realize there was an issue with daycare, talking about the NFLPA survey, did that pass the smell test for you? No, that was that was horrendous. Um and a huge mistake on his part. It showed, I don't want to say it showed, but if you have your doubts about ownership, or at least about Robert Kraft at his age and what he's doing, it gives people fuel for the fire that he's out of touch and he doesn't know what's going on with the team. You know, because we talked about this when the the, the this year's version of the NFL PA survey came out. And again, Child care at the games, not having a family room was on the survey for the second straight year. And, you know, what Robert said today about that should be an easy fix. That's what we said. That's what we said when the survey came out. They didn't fix it. It, it, This wasn't the first year of the NFLPA survey. Are they trying, is Jonathan trying to keep things away from his father? So for whatever reason, like it just, it made him look – it was a bad moment. It made him look out of touch. And if I were him, I would be pissed off at somebody 
for uh, not putting him in a better, better position on that question. But to me, there's no excuse for it. There's no excuse for them not fixing that in one year. I'm going to stop you right there because I'm going to ask you a question. And you can answer it in any way you want to. The last couple of times that we've seen Robert speak at, at Mayo's introductory press conference today, seems like he gets a little bit ahead of himself, Greg. And he's walking himself into some of these mistakes. And look, I don't expect him to be on top of everything, okay? I know some people expect that from their ownership. I don't. The, the, they're not going to know every scintilla of information. But is it time that we might entertain the idea of having Jonathan step in and, and do these press conferences? and and Or because or, I don't want to say have somebody. You can't have somebody there standing you know, next to Robert correcting him on things because that's a terrible look. Are we going to continue with the Robert Kraft stuff and have Robert have these press conferences where he just, you know, he says too much, he makes these mistakes? Or is it time to start this transition to Jonathan and, and give him the ball and say, let him take accountability at these press conferences? If he is more in tune with day-to-day stuff, let him be the, the face of the franchise for the ownership now. <laughs> we, we didn't talk about this in, in, in the email before the show. Um, but you basically read my mind. Um, Mike Giardi wrote off the press conference, and and I'm going to let you know what Mike wrote sort of um, carry the day, and and I'll come back in a couple of days. But my overwhelming thought leaving Robert's press conference today was, and 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 I'm trying to be as re- I, I I have the ultimate respect for Robert Kraft, and um. And I, I do think that he's he's certainly still uh, a titanic figure in terms of, well, that's probably not the right word. He's a huge figure. He's a titan of the NFL still. You know, when he goes around the owners' meetings, what he says, he has a lot of sway, certainly in business dealings, in television dealings, and all that. But as far as, and, and the other side of the coin with this thing is, we all know he loves this stuff. He loves being in front of the camera. We saw him in the dynasty. He he wants to be the guy. So that's part of the equation that I don't even know if they can get him to back down because he loves to be in that position. He's the owner. He gets to do what he wants to do. But putting that all that aside, my overriding thought leaving the press conference today was it's time for Jonathan Kraft to start answering questions about this franchise that there need to be some tough questions answered. Um, There needs to be a back and forth. There needs to be follow-ups. And where Robert is at this point, it's just, it's not fair to him. Um, It's not fair to the fans, um, at least some of the fans. Like, we all know, or at least we have a pretty good idea. Look, Jonathan Kraft and Robin Glazer are running this team, the behind the scenes. That's what they are doing. They are more involved Um, than a lot of people know. And for them to put Robert Kraft basically out there as sort of a shield from the tough questions, I'm sorry, it doesn't cut it anymore. Not with what's gone on with this franchise. And you can't just wave a, it was all Bill's fault type of thing. And then we're just like, okay, well, now we're going to wait and see. Like, no, Jonathan, I I completely agree with you. I think it's time. and, And Robert can certainly do his role. But in terms of, Day-to-day accountability of this franchise and where it is, it's time for Jonathan Kraft to stand up and answer the questions. I just want to clarify one thing before people take a a snippet of what you just said and and run with it. Regarding Glazer and Jonathan Kraft's involvement, you are not talking about football decisions, correct? You're talking about the day-to-day business, the survey stuff, and all of that. Yeah. All right. I just don't want to, you know, this world in 2024, I just want to make that clear that Greg is not throwing out there that Glazer and Jonathan Kraft are the GMs of this team. He's talking about the day-to-day business side of the operation and being the ownership stewards of this franchise. That's what Greg's talking about. I want to make that clear for everybody Uh, uh, watching and listening. Yeah. A hundred percent. Cause I, I, you know, there was that mention in the Seth Wickersham 
article and um, about how there's some people around the team that believe like once Bill's gone, that Jonathan Kraft and Robin Glazer were going to run football operations. Seth reported that. I don't know that to be true. I don't know how involved he is as far as all that goes on, but I'm just talking about the day-to-day operations of the team, oversight of the team, what's going on, not not involved in football decisions, but just oversight of the team. I think though Jonathan Kraft and Robin Glazer are now the point person, point people for the day-to-day operations and accountability of the football team. All right, one thing that, that clarifies it. I don't know if I did. <laughs> that, one thing that uh, Robert did bring up was a $50 million workout facility. Uh, is this the new gym or is this more involved than we thought? Yeah, this is this has been in the works. People have been whispering about it. Um, <clears throat> even Paul Perillo and uh, Fred Kirsch over on um, you know Patriots.com sort of intimated at this at some point about the NFLPA survey that – um, and, and I do think this goes back to um, to Belichick. I think he drew up some plans. Um, certainly, you know, when I talked to, to talk to Tom Silverstein the other day for the podcast last week, one of the things he brought up, which, which sort of surprised me, was that he, he said, I wouldn't be surprised if Elliot um, really tries to upgrade the facilities and, and what goes on, because that was a big thing of his father with the Packers in terms of making it more enticing for players to want to be in the building and stick around. And there's not a lot to do in green Bay, but if the, we make it really nice for the players and the, the, the Lambo, when they did everything, it's, it's spectacular. The, the, the rooms and stuff that they have behind the scenes for the players. And so um, I think this has been in the works. I think the NFL PA survey has been a little kick in the pants that uh, maybe they were dragging their feet a little bit, but this is going to be a big deal from what I understand. I think it's going to be connected to the stadium, but it's going to be sort of a standalone football facility that they think is going to be first class and really enhance football operations as a whole. All right, we've got more on crafts. We've got more on the NFL rule changes that popped up today. I want to get Greg's thoughts on those. But first, I want to remind you this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. And also check out Greg and company at BSJ, 50 bucks for the year. They do fantastic work. Uh, of course, Greg just mentioned Mike Giardi writing from down there in Orlando as well as they tag team the meetings this week. So some great stuff there, 50 bucks for the year. All right, two more things quickly on Kraft, and then we'll move to the rules. He was frustrated, he said, by the docuseries, the dynasty, the approach of the docuseries being so focused on the controversies instead of the success. What would you think of that comment? Bull crap. More <laughs> bull crap. More playing to the crowd. You know, some of the players are voicing their opinions. So, you know, what's he going to do? Disagree with them and say, you know, I actually disagree with them that I, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was very fair. And look, this is all he, they were, they had the book done by Jeff Benedict. This was based on the book. A lot of the stuff was in the book. Benedict wrote the series there. They copyrighted it. They own it. Craft Dynasty LLC. Um, And again, this is just him playing to the masses, trying to be the good guy, the teddy bear, all that stuff. I thought it was um, complete bull crap. He knew exactly what was going on. This was their construction. And I think Jeff Benedict and Hamashek executed exactly what the crafts wanted in terms of highlighting, um, or, or at least, yeah, highlighting Robert Kraft's role and everything to enhance his Hall of Fame um, credentials and to blame Belichick for the downfall of the dynasty. And I think it was mission accomplished from that standpoint. And I think that's what they wanted. And um, I, I, again, I think it was complete bull crap. I will say, I was talking to somebody here at the league meetings. And first of all, Nick, let me tell you, um, ownership. And look, I'm not telling you how many, but I will say multiple owners thought the dynasty thing was um, not good, did not reflect well 
on Robert Kraft. Some of them are joking about it behind his back. Oh, boy. Um, and, and also, um, there was one other tidbit. Somebody told me, uh, I'll leave that one out just because it was, uh, it, it was too much, you know, rumor mongering, but just, let's just say that, um, that Kraft before the blowback Kraft was pretty proud of this docuseries. Interesting. Uh, final question. He mostly dodged the question from you guys down there about Belichick being unfairly maligned. Uh, dodging it, did that did that speak volumes? Yes, and uh, that was the so. Just to paint the scene for people, a little like inside baseball. So, you know, we're there talking with Robert and Stacy James, um, the uh, the director of media relations for our uh, vice president of media relations for the Patriots. Um, you could hear him. He said two more questions. Um, Tom Curran, Mike Reese, and I were sort of looking at each other saying like, who, you know, <laughs> we need to ask about the dynasty. Yeah. And uh, I would have been fine doing it. Um, Reese decided to do it. He asked the first question. Good job by Mike. Um, I thought, I didn't think Kraft, I think a lot of fans wanted to be asked about Bill Belichick. So when Reese asked the question, Stacey James said, that's the, uh, last question, Mike Reese asked it. He did not reflect on Bill Belichick, which I thought was in was not good. I thought he needed to be asked about Bill Belichick. So I asked the follow-up, and you can sort of see Robert looking at Stacey James like, I think I thought this was supposed to be over, but I thought that it was very important that he was asked specifically about Bill Belichick and that he completely punted on it and and didn't say anything really about it other than, you know, plug Tom Brady's uh, <laughs> night on June 12th and that they hope to have something f similar for Bill Belichick at some point in time. Again, just not good enough. Not good enough at all. I, I don't know if he wasn't prepped for it or what. It's hard for me to believe, but it, I, I did not think it was good. Yeah, let's just give the people the full quote. He said, uh, and this is thanks to Andrew Callahan, who transcribed it on, on Twitter. I feel so privileged that we had Bill here. And, you know, we hope when he's finished that we're going to have a chance to honor him the way we did. We will do with Tom Brady this year. You know, we did this little ceremony, and this is off the rails at this point. We did this little ceremony <laughs> at halftime of the Eagles game, but it was not adequate. And we look forward to being able to celebrate putting him into the Patriots Hall of Fame on 6-12-24. And, you know... I look forward to the privilege of putting Bill into the Patriots Hall of Fame one day in the future. That was the comment to Greg's question. Not uh, good enough. Yeah. Not good enough. All right, let's go to the rule changes. Uh, NFL making a lot of uh, a lot of changes, Greg, and I think some of them will be significant. Let's start with mm -hmm. the most controversial first, the banning of the hip drop tackle. Yeah, I... I don't know how they're going to officiate this thing. Um, I really don't. Um, it's something that I'm going to have to see in action. Uh, apparently, it's going to be more fines after the fact than 15-yard penalties. But um, this is this is going to be hard for me. It's an officiating nightmare, and uh, they don't like to do that. They don't like to put their officials in that that circumstance. I'll be very interested to hear because we always get uh, the officials come out and they speak to the media normally when they come and do a joint practice or what have you. And uh, I'll be very interested to f hear from the officials how they feel about this rule change and the position it puts them in. All right. There's going to be a new kickoff this season. Uh, I love this, by the way, because now I think kickoffs will matter. Uh, but basically, damn, Judge Judy says there are no basicallys. There are no basicallys. Here's the deal. The coverage team starts at the 40-yard line. The return team, the blockers, will be there at the 35-yard line. Kicker kicks to the kickoff returner. And then the action happens. What do you think? I love it. Um, you know, and I think this saves a lot of people's jobs, including special teams coordinators and returners and special teams players and things like that. I think somewhere Bill Belichick is salivating over this. I mean, I, I just think, I think it's a safe way to do the kickoff, just having them in a five yard zone. Um, 
you know, because that's always been my issue with special teams, punt returns, kickoff returns, especially it's like, it's a car crash. It's, it's, it's just not healthy for the players. And so, um, I think it's going to be dynamic. I think it's, I'm actually going to make sure I'm there to watch kickoffs where, you know, in the past couple of years, I've been like, I'm going to the bathroom. I can be back, you <laughs> yep. know, in time, yep. you know, but now kickoff returns are going to be must watch TV, which I think was the aim of this. And I think it's going, I think it's going to be tremendous. I can't wait to see the innovations about reverses and, you know, how are we going to, we're going to pull a blocker and who, what kind of players are you putting on special teams? Are you going to keep six tight ends? Like, is it, you know, is it going to be linebackers, safeties? Like, I think it's all fascinating. A couple points here. I would say it really shines a light on how antiquated the NFL is. And the fact that they're just so slow to change things significantly. This is another thing where they just take it from the XFL. Like, oh, wow, that's interesting. We would have never thought of that. Why are people in the NFL not thinking about it? Or if they're thinking about it, why are those people being, you know, suffocated, so to speak, when it's time to maybe make some changes? This is why baseball took forever for the pitch clock. Like, if you have a good idea and it makes the game fun, then bring it to the table and talk about it. And these owners across the league are just so damn scared of changing things. Oh, what's going to happen? I-, I think this is going to be fun. I want to ask you, though, Greg, because you're a nuts and bolts, meat and potatoes kind of guy. D- mm-hmm. Does this change player value? Do you think it changes how some teams might construct their roster now? Maybe maybe putting a little bit more emphasis on returners, for example. I think so, but it's interesting hearing uh, Eric Galco, um, who used to be the XL, XFL's director of player personnel, he helped implement this in the XFL. He has a fascinating thread on X about the ramifications that it has, and he actually thinks that it's – You know, you could, you could, you could see this might help the running backs. Like he thinks it's more of a running back position that um, instead of just speed guys. And so um, you could now keep three or four running backs because you might need one as a returner. So again, this goes to the, it's going to be very interesting to see how teams deal with it, but it's certainly going to change some things in terms of personnel. Interesting you say that because that means uh, it it might up the value of Antonio Gibson. You know, it's somebody on the Patriots roster now who might be a little bit more dynamic. Pop Douglas. Imagine him in in that kind of setting there. If you you get by a couple dudes, it's you're off to the races. Going to be interesting. All right. A few more things quickly. Replay assistant is now allowed to correct roughing the passer and intentional grounding, Greg. Uh, I like it. I, I think, you know, when it, when it comes to like headshots and stuff like that, like, you know, get it right. I don't think it's been officiated consistently and that's been a big source of frustration. You know, hopefully this helps whether it ultimately does. I need to see it in action. I think it gets us closer to the spy judge, the sky judge, not the spy judge, Nick, the sky judge, which is uh, <laughs> which is a good thing. Maybe they, maybe we do need a spy judge in uh, in football. All right, third replay challenge added after one successful challenge. It used to be two. Do you care? Hate it. I I I hate it. Now now you get rewarded for you know getting fifty percent right. Like no, you want the third challenge. Get your two challenges right. Now now guys are just going to be more willing to challenge. I don't like it, but you know maybe maybe there's something I'm not seeing. I know this is going to make me sound like old man yelling at the clouds, but my concern is way too many replay reviews, man. Like the sky judge is a good idea, but that means we're going to have more reviews. We're going to have more corrections on the field. Then you're adding a challenge. Like Greg said, by going 50% on on your first challenge out of your first two challenges. So um, that just how many reviews do we need? I've been watching the NCAA tournament and my God, some of these games in the Mm -hmm. final three minutes, when the guy has to go there and look at every, the Zapruder film over and over and over again, and the final two minutes of a basketball game is now 40. It's, I, I just, that's my concern is just too much of that. Uh, you can promote now a, I'm sure Belichick would have loved this last year with the 50,000 quarterback transactions he made. You can now promote a practice squad quarterback as an emergency quarterback on game days, an unlimited amount of times, Greg. Oh yeah. 
Nathan Rourke's not going to be a <laughs> secret <laughs> weapon on game day. Yeah, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> All right, last one for you. The trade deadline is kicked back one week. It's now going to be Tuesday after week nine. Kick it back further. You know, let's let's get it going. Let's do it like, you know, before the final month of the season, like the final like five weeks. I still think week nine is, is too early. It's an improvement. You know, it should have been done before when they went to 17 games. But uh, it needs to be – it needs to be more dynamic. That thing, you push it back a little bit more – uh, it could be must-see TV. All right. Greg will be blasting out of Orlando to come back home in the next 24 hours or so. Safe travels, my friend. Great stuff. If something big happens, Greg and I, I'm sure, will be all over it. But uh, I think this does it for us this week. So everybody enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Have some fun. And uh, Greg and I will be back next week to cover all things Patriots. Patriots. 